Good morning. So I want to see if we can finish up chapter seven today, which gives quite a potpourri of carbon-carbon bond forming reactions. And I think what I'm going to do is keep kind of parallel to the chapter and really uh, put things into a context that I think is going to better, better contextualize some of the chemistry you've read about. There's some reactions I'd love to add right now, some organometallic chemistry, heck chemistry, Grubbs chemistry. I'm going to see maybe at the end of chapter eight if we have room for chapter eight, which I think we'll be starting on on Monday is more sort of general strategies in synthesis. It's a little bit more nebulous to talk about, but we'll see how it goes. All right, so I've been pushing the idea of the carbonyl group being central in carbon-carbon bond forming reactions. We've seen addition of organometallic reagents to the carbonyl group. We've seen carbonyl chemistry of enolates and Michael acceptors and the whole bit. So I was talking before about enols and acid catalyzed reactions and about iminium ions. And I want to keep up this thread of the relationship between nitrogen and oxygen, the homology between nitrogen and oxygen in reactivity of carbonyl compounds. So we talked before about enols, and I said, of course, enols are not stable compounds. They're not compounds you can put in a bottle, but you can generate them transiently in the course of reactions. Enols are weak nucleophiles. And so I want to introduce the nitrogen analog of, e of enols, and that's enamines. Now, whereas in general, in general, you can't isolate an enol, alpha beta unsaturated, um, 1, 3 dicarbonyl compound enols are sometimes isolatable, but in general, you can't isolate an enol. But on the other hand, the nitrogen analogs are much more stable. They're called enamines. They're a little bit more nucleophilic. I'd still sort of call them weaker nucleophiles, but they're not really, really weak. And so I'll say more nucleophilic than an enol. And if you want to contextualize this a little bit, you can think about electronegativity, right? The electronegativity of oxygen is 3.4. In other words, the oxygen really wants to hold on to its electrons. And we've seen this sort of schizophrenic relationship with oxygen on aromatic systems, where on the one hand, it's pumping in electrons from the lone pairs. In other words, it's donating into the pi. On the other hand, it's taking electrons away from the sigma bond because it is electronegative. In other words, Oxygen is not, is only moderately giving with electrons. Now, nitrogen is a little bit less electronegative. It's still electronegative. Its electronegativity is 3.0. Nitrogen is more willing to donate electrons. In other words, it still gets a little greedy. It still wants to pull them away, but it's more willing to push push them in. We're going to see that in enamine chemistry in a moment. If I have a chance, and in part because your textbook takes, takes us through this, I want to then draw an analogy between an enolate. Remember we said that enolates are stronger nucleophiles. And the nitrogen analog of the enol enamine anion or imi, technically, I guess you would get it from an imine anion, but so I'll say, I'll call it an imine anion, but technically what you'll hear these referred to is as metalloenamines, because invariably you're going to have a metal associated with it. 
phenamine. And these tend to also be strong nucleophiles. So I want to take the next maybe 20 minutes to put these species into context to make some analogies to carbonyl chemistry and also to show you since we're focusing on synthesis not just reactivity to focus on how enamines and metalloenamines uh, end up being very useful reagents for carbon-carbon bond forming reactions. So enamines were really popularized as a reagent by Gilbert Stork. It was sort of his initial claim to fame in the uh, late 50s and early 60s. So what Stork ended up doing was Taking the reaction that we know, that you can take an amine and take a ketone, a secondary amine, and allow them to react to form an enamine. So that's known if you go back to your sophomore organic chemistry book when you talk about derivatives of carbonyl compounds, you'll see enamines. Usually we catalyze this reaction with a little bit of acid. Tosic acid, PTSOH is typical. Usually we drive out, I'm not writing a balanced equation, but you lose one molecule of water. We drive that reaction usually in benzene or toluene with azeotropic distillation of water. That means you distill off the benzene, but, and the water separates in the distillate, and you let the upper layer of the benzene drip back in. But what Stork did, was then use enamines as reagents in alkylation and in other carbonyl chemistry in conjugate addition. And so the basic sequence is you would make your enamine, then you would go ahead, treat it with an electrophile, an alkyl halide. I'm giving an example of an allyl, primary allylic halide. They're good electrophiles. Methyl iodide is a good electrophile. Benzyl bromide is a good electrophile. Secondary is not so good. But with a reasonably good electrophile, you get SN2 alkylation. And after an aqueous workup, you get the corresponding alkylated compound. I'll show you why this is useful in a second. From a mechanistic point of view, what we're talking about is your enamine. And he usually, Stork would usually use three different ones are popular. Pyrrolidine, papyridine, and morpholine. Those are all amines that you saw in your, in your chapter where we talked about nomenclature. I'll just write them out here. They all have slightly different characteristics in terms of the enamines, but for your purposes, you can think of them as, as sort of comparable. Slight differences in basicity and nucleophilicity. All right, so from a mechanistic point of view, what's happening? Your enamine, just like an enol, just like an enolate, is nucleophilic at your beta, at your alpha position. And so I'll write this mechanistically just with a curved arrow. Electrons flow down from the nitrogen. We do an SN2 displacement. You end up with an iminium ion, but with the carbon-carbon bond formed the aminium ion might go back to its own enamine, but it's probably going to sit around until workup where you're adding aqueous, uh, where you're adding aqueous acid or adding water, and that's going to hydrolyze the aminium ion. Water attacks the aminium ion, you form a tetrahedral intermediate, you shuffle some protons around, you kick out the amine, you get back to the carbonyl compound. In other words, it's the exact reverse of Imine, of enamine formation and imine formation
except now it's being driven Le Chatelier's principle. Here you're taking out water with the azeotropic distillation. Here you're putting in water with the aqueous workup. So if you look at this chemistry, this chemistry was developed a little bit before LDA was introduced. So if you look at this series of reactions, make the enamine, carry out the alkylation, this is exactly identical to what you could do with LDA and then allobromide that would take you exactly to the same place. Now, there are many ways to carry out reactions, but often there are specific utility of one set of conditions over another. And when I talked about aldehydes and I talked about LDA chemistry, I kind of dropped a hint to you. I said, you know, LDA works great for making enolates of ketones and esters and amides, and you can even make dianions of carboxylic acids, and they're all sort of the same in their reactivity. Enolates of aldehydes are problematic. Aldehydes have a tremendous propensity to, to self-condense. In general, you can't take an aldehyde, treat it with LDA, and make the enolate cleanly. In general, you get aldol reaction occurring rather than that directed aldol that I've talked to you so much about and said how much I like in that you can make an enolate stoichiometrically. So you don't have that element of control. So let me show you an example of where enamine chemistry would shine and then just show you what would happen if we tried that same chemistry with, an alde with LDA. All right, so let's take as an example butyraldehyde. If you treat butyraldehyde with, we'll use pyrrolidine again, and we'll use catalytic toxic acid, PTSOH, benzene to make the enamine. I'll write the enamine like this. It just sort of keeps it tidier in terms of my drawing rather than having it poke up. Now you have a ready source of a nucleophile that you can do chemistry with. We just did alkylation. To give you some diversity in the examples, I'll show you another example, Michael addition, conjugate addition. I'll give you ethyl acrylate. And we'll do treat the enamine with ethyl acrylate, carry out an aqueous workup. And the product of reaction now is going to be the conjugate addition. Operationally, what you would do is you wouldn't keep this enamine around a long time. Operationally, you would make the enamine probably insolvent, probably not even distill it, take your benzene solution, and then go ahead and add ethyl acrylate and then carry out your aqueous workup. Now, if you look on paper, you'd say, okay, well, why can't I just go ahead and take my aldehyde and treat it with LDA and try to, just like I showed on the other blackboard, do the series of reactions where I then add ethyl acrylate and water. The problem is you end up getting self-condensation. And so enamines really shine as this controlled sort of nucleophile. The other thing that's nice is in terms of efficiency on scale, LDA chemistry is great on a gram scale. You can use a few mils of butyl lithium to make your LDA. You can scale it up and go 50 or 80 mils of butyl lithium solution up to, you know, tenth mole scale without too much problem. If you want to do this on a bucket scale, if you want to make 100 grams of material, this chemistry here, this enamine chemistry, cheap and efficient and goes ahead and forms your carbon-carbon bonds on a bulk scale with inexpensive reagents, as well as having some unique benefits.
All right. So I started and said we've got an analogy between enols and enamines, and I said we've got an analogy between enolates and metalloenamines. So let me show you that chemistry. And I'll give you a specific example for starters. If you take an aldehyde, or you can take a ketone, and instead of taking a secondary amine, you take a primary amine, you get the, the, you get the imine. Remember, enamines form because you cannot have a neutral addict of a secondary amine and a carbonyl compound without pulling off that alpha proton to get the enamine. But if you have a primary amine, and I'll give you as an example tert-butylamine, then just by pulling protons off the nitrogen, you can get a neutral addict, in this case the tert-butylamine. And the analogy that I was making before is that the alpha position is very acidic. I mean, not very acidic, pardon me. The alpha position is acidic, much like the alpha position of a carbonyl. In terms of practicality, it means you can pull off a proton off the alpha position to make an analog of an enolate. The base in practice that's often used is something you don't typically think of as a base. A Grignard reagent is basic. There's one example you've probably seen, probably in sophomore chemistry, of Grignard reagents being used as a base in synthetic organic chemistry. Often people will use a Grignard reagent like ethyl magnesium bromide to take a proton off an acetylene. Remember that one? Yeah. It just ends up being a suitable base. Remember, when we think about pKa's, and you think, whoops, ethyl magnesium bromide, and you think about an alkane, right, because we're thinking about ethyl magnesium bromide as sort of a conjugate base of ethane, you think very basic, pKa about 50 for ethane. A Grignard reagent is very basic. There's more covalent bond character in the magnesium carbon bond than there is in the lithium carbon bond. In other words, it's less of a naked carbanion, it's more covalent. But nevertheless, it acts as a base. So your alpha proton here is going to be, I don't know the pK off the top of my head, it's going to be about 20 or 25, much like a ketone. And so it's fine as a base. It's not nucleophilic to enough to add to the imine group. Imines are less electrophilic than ketones. They're more prone to deprotonation, and so you're less, less likely to go ahead and get deprotonation. So if we go ahead and we pull off the alpha proton, then we add an alkylating agent. I've just taken benzyl bromide, benzyl bromide, allyl bromide, methyl iodide, all great alkylating agents, and finally carry out an aqueous workup. The product of this reaction is going to be the alkylated compound. In other words, we are addressing the exact same problem I addressed on the left-hand blackboard that you can't go ahead and use LDA or other bases to conveniently make an enolate of an aldehyde. So we use a trick. We go ahead, we first we make the imine, second we make the enolate equivalent, the metalloenamine, and we alkylate, and then third we hydrolyze the imine. So briefly, if you want that spelled out, here's our imine. Here's our ethyl magnesium bromide. You get the equivalent of an enolate, except the nitrogen analog. 
like so. In other words, just like you might have a lithium enolate with O minus or OLI plus, here you have N minus BGMR plus, or covalent bond is probably a more accurate representation. So that carries out the alkylation reaction. We can just think of electrons as flowing down. Electrons is flowing down from the double bond, kicking out the Rx group. And now when we carry out our aqueous workup, we hydrolyze the imine to the corresponding carbonyl, just like we hydrolyze the aminium ion to the corresponding carbonyl. Thoughts, questions? I want to touch on one last aspect of this chemistry, and in, again, in part because your textbook does, but I don't think they do a great job of... Uh, can you explain the ethyl? What happened to the ethyl part of the ethylization? Ah, okay. What happened to the ethyl part? So, and I'll draw it out. All right, so we can think of ethyl magnesium bromide as an ethyl anion and magnesium bromide cation. Just realize that this is predominantly a polar covalent bond. In other words, what I am drawing here is simply a non-bond resonance structure. Well, here you have your alpha proton. You pull off that, you kick electrons up, I'll even be a good person. That takes us up to the nitrogen anion, like so, and you can just think of it as associating with the bromomagnesium cation of forming a covalent bond. Oh, good question. Other questions? All right, I want to do one last thing with metalloenamines, and as I said, in part because your textbook does, and introduce one example of specific use of a special type of metalloenamine, and this is called SAMP and RAMP hydrozones. So this is sort of, which are useful in asymmetric alkylation chemistry. So this is some, you notice that, you notice that chemistry is a, synthetic organic chemistry is in particular this play of ideas where you have some fundamental reactivity and somebody says, oh, I can use this reactivity in this way and then other people continue to play with, play with the idea. So people had carbonyl chemistry, they then played with nitrogen chemistry and said, okay, we can make special use of that. Um, now, Dieter Enders came up with the idea of using a chiral imine and making that imine a hydrozone, I'll show you what I mean in order to go ahead and do an asymmetric alkylation. So let me show you the example that I'll give you. Imagine three pentanone, and we go ahead and now, I'm gonna use this molecule here. This is a derivative of the amino acid pyrrolidine. This is the S derivative, so it is called SAMP, which stands for uh, amino, amino S, I think it's S aminopyrrolidine or 
something to that effect. Anyway, if you go ahead and generate a specialized imine called a hydrazone with the hydrazine and the pyrrolidine, you get the following, which is really just a fancy imine. All right, so here is your hydrazone. Now, if we do the same basic idea, we're going to pull off the alpha proton. In this case, in the Ender's chemistry, we use LDA. And then we go ahead, we generate the, uh, we, so that generates the metalloenamine. And then we take an alkylating agent. I'm going to take n-propyl iodide, CH3, CH2, CH2I2, uh, I in this example. And finally, and I'm not going to go into the mechanism, but you can cleave hydrazones with ozone. The overall result is now that you get back to the carbonyl. You've introduced your propyl group, which I will just write as PR. And importantly, you've set this stereocenter with 98%, 97 to 98% EE. And what's nice about amino acids is even though nature gives us the S amino acids, the R amino acids are available through chemoenzymatic processes. So we can get either the S compound or the R reagent, which is called RAMP. And thus, in your toolbox, you can form either enantiomer with a high degree of enantiomeric excess. And so this fits into the broad category of asymmetric synthesis. Which we have touched on before, which basically says when you're making molecules, you usually want to be able to control which enantiomer you're making. If you're making a drug, one enantiomer is going to be bioactive in the desired fashion. The other will probably not be bioactive in the desired fashion and may actually be detrimental. All right, changing gears a little bit, I think I want to now take us use some carbonyl groups in the Wittig reaction. Again, in part, I want to be paralleling your textbook here and just touching on a few topics that they touch on. So we've all seen the Wittig reaction in sophomore organic chemistry. In the Wittig reaction, you take a ketone or an aldehyde, You treat the ketone or aldehyde with a phosphorus illid. I'll call it R3, R4. I have a very mixed relationship on writing these general structures because on the one hand, they give us the most general example of a reaction. On the other hand, they can be a little confusing. The, key, the ketone or aldehyde combines with the illid to form an alkene. This reaction was developed by George Wittig. He received the Nobel Prize in 1979 for the reaction. And the reaction proceeds by way of an oxophosphatane. You've probably seen all of this in your sophomore organic chemistry class. 
and the oxophosphatase breaks down to give triphenylphosphine oxide. and your alkene. Now the Wittig reaction is very nice because it gives you a way of building up molecules. It gives you a way of taking simpler molecules, smaller molecules, and adding complexity, adding structure, building up from readily available smaller molecules to more specific larger molecules. So by way of an example, a specific example, let's take bromopentane and we'll go ahead and we'll react it with another molecule to build up a bigger molecule. So first I'm going to go ahead and make the phosphorus ilid. We do that by an SN2 alkylation to give the phosphonium salt. The pentol triphenyl phosphonium bromide forms by an SN2 reaction. The phosphorus has a lone pair of electrons on it. It attacks, kicks out bromide. Phosphorus is below nitrogen in the periodic table. It is a nucleophile, very much like amines, but being one row down in the periodic table is a little bit softer, meaning it is less basic and at the same time more nucleophilic in reactions like SN2 reactions. The protons at the alpha position of the phosphonium salt are relatively acidic. Their pKa is about 23. That's a lousy 23 and a not so good pKa. And so with a base of reasonable strength, you can take off those protons stoichiometrically. Often, if you want to get, so as I said, one of the things about the Wittig reaction is it's good for forming carbon-carbon bonds. The other thing that's very exciting about the Wittig reaction is it can have very good stereoselectivity, and often that stereoselectivity is contra-thermodynamic, meaning that you get the cis-alkene preferentially. To get the cis-alkene preferentially, you end up needing to have base conditions that are often called salt-free, where you're using a, a salt that doesn't coordinate, doesn't interact. So whereas butyl lithium might be a go-to base in many cases, or LDA might be a go-to base in many cases, we want to avoid lithium salts if we want to get stereoselectivity. So a related base to LDA is sodium hexamethyl disilazid. Let me write that out here. It looks like a sort of Frankensteinian analog of LDA, right? In other words, in LDA you have a lithium and you have two isopropyl groups. Here you have two trimethyl silo groups and a sodium. Sodium hexamethyl disilazid to a first order approximation, you could say it's sort of comparable to LDA in basicity. It's actually a little bit less basic. The, sol the silicon is a little more electron donating, so the nitrogen's a little bit electro less electron deficient. So the pK of the conjugate acid is maybe 30 here for hexadentmethyl disilazane and 36 for diisopropylamine. But as I said, it's a good enough base to pull off your protons. That gives rise, we probably use THF as a solvent. That gives rise to the corresponding illid. 
An ilid is just a fancy word for a compound in which you have charge separation. You can write another resonance structure of the ilid. It is not one, it is not the other, but it is both at once. But generally, I prefer the charge separated resonance structure. They both contribute. But double bonds between carbon and elements below it in the periodic table, like phosphorus, tend to be very weak. There isn't much double bond character. So in other words, your ilid is probably 80% this resonance structure, 20% this resonance structure. And of course, it doesn't mean that it alternates or vibrates or oscillates or resonates between those in spite of the name resonance structure. It means it is both at once and basically you could say it is at the same time a mixture of 60% of this, or of 80% of this and 20% of that at the same time. So if we take this ilid and we treat it, and I'm just going to give you an example in synthesis. I want to show you the stereoselectivity here. So for the heck of it, what I've done, I've taken a real example from the literature. We're going to take a nine carbon aldehyde. We treat this with a nine carbon aldehyde with an acetoxy group on one end. And the overall result is we get an alkene And the stereoselectivity really is fantastic. This is an actual example from the literature. It's 98 to 2 trans, uh, cis to trans. And there's been a good deal of work on why the reaction is contrathermodynamic, why you get the cis alkene. I don't want to go into the, the details of that, in part because I think it's not, not that important at this level, and in part because I think it's still a little bit, little bit up in the air. But suffice it to say, in this particular case, we can get very good stereoselectivity. And so the general rule is an ilid like this, what we would call an unstabilized ilid, are cis-selective. And that really is qualified by being under these so-called salt-free conditions. If I had used lithium hexamethyl disilazid or butyl lithium, I would have gotten a lot less stereoselectivity. Conversely, and again sort of paralleling your textbook, stabilized ilids are transselective. And I'll give you an example. By stabilized, I mean that there is another group, an electron withdrawing group, stabilizing the negative charge, that it's not only dependent on the phosphorus. And so the example I'll give you, I think it's from your textbook, but it certainly is a classic trans-selective reagent that's useful for building, building up molecules, is if we take ethyl bromoacetate and make the phosphorus ilid of that, so first, SN2 displacement to make the triphenylphosphonium salt. Now, your alpha protons here are really, really quite acidic. They're pKa of about 7. In other words, many orders of magnitude more acidic than the unstabilized ilid, right? Because that negative charge is going to get enolate-like stabilization as well as the ilid stabilization from the phosphorus. So now you don't need a very strong base to pull off those protons. Sodium hydroxide in water is sufficient to pull off the protons, and you generate this stabilized ilid. Uh, 
I'll write the hydrogen in just so you can see it, just to help you keep track, because I know we're putting up, putting up a lot of molecules very fast today. So there's our illid. You can actually buy that illid. It's stable enough to isolate. If I go ahead and say I made this illid here, I probably would make it in situ and then use it because it's basic enough that it's very water sensitive. It's nucleophilic enough and electron rich enough that it's oxidizable by air. I wouldn't want to keep it in a bottle for a long time. But this particular illid is just fine. So if we then go ahead and we take some aldehyde, I'm just going to write this as RCHO and treat it with this illid. We go ahead, we lose triphenylphosphine oxide and we get with very good selectivity the trans compound. There's a related reaction called the Arbazov reaction. The Arbazov reaction, instead of triphenylphosphine, uses a diethyl phosphite group. Your textbook doesn't show it, and that's just fine. It's sort of six of one, half a dozen of the other. Triethyl phosphite reacts to give a phosph diethyl phosphoryl compound here, which can also be deprotonated and also used. The truth is, <clears throat> I'm not a big fan of triphenylphosphine. Often when you do a Wittig reaction, the triphenylphosphine is a pain in the neck to, the triphenylphosphine oxide is a pain in the neck to remove. It tails in column chromatography and the like. And so reagents that avoid triphenylphosphine end up being, being useful. I also won't go into it, but your textbook drops a hint at how Clark Still and Janeri developed a cis-selective analog of this reaction. Organic chemistry, synthetic organic chemistry is all about control, and people want to be able to control the stereoselectivity of a reaction and get either diastereomer, either enantiomer, and so often you end up having this element of control. All right, I want to wrap up by talking about the cyclopropanation of alkenes. And at a formal level, you could think of an alkene reacting with a carbene now, carbene is a new species for you, probably. You haven't seen a carbene before. A carbene is a divalent copper, a divalent carbon species. Carbenes, in general, are highly reactive. In general, you can't put a carbene in a bottle. They want a complete octet. You can think of a carbene, this is what we call a singlet carbene. You can think of the carbene as having a lone pair in an sp2 hybrid orbital and then a vacant p orbital. So you can think of it sort of as a trigonal planar geometry leading to a bent molecule where you have a lone pair in an sp2 orbital and a vacant p orbital. Another useful shorthand for a carbene, for a singlet carbene, is to think of it as having both a plus character and a minus character. In other words, the lone pair wants to donate electrons, the p orbital wants to get electrons, the overall result is that we get a cyclopropane under the right conditions. I'll write this as X and Y. 
And basically, you can think of it as, OK, here's our carbene. Here's our lone pair. Here's our vacant p orbital. Here's our alkene. And you can think of it as the carbene donating in electrons to the alkene and receiving them. This is actually a cycloaddition reaction, if you think about it. It is what could be called a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition, two electrons coming from the alkene, two electrons coming from the carbene. And what's cool about this reaction, it is a cycloaddition. It is stereospecific. And by that, I mean that if I take a transalkene and I take a, we'll call it R1, R, and R prime, and I take a carbene, we go ahead and we get the trans. cyclopropane, and if we take a cisalkene and we take that same carbene, we get the cis cyclopropane. Just like in the Diels-Alder reaction where you have this preservation of stereochemistry. I guess I called it R and R prime. Now this chemistry was really developed by Doring first at Harvard in 1954 as a practical reaction. And I'll give you a real example. Let us take trans-2-pentene. The carbenes in general that we're talking about require some resonance stabilization. And that resonance stabilization often will come from halogens. So the chemistry that Doring developed involves use of dichlorocarbene and dibromocarbene. I'll show you first the reaction conditions and then show you how the carbene forms. So if we take 2-pentene, trans-2-pentene, and we treat it with chloroform and potassium tert-butoxide in butanol, the product of the reaction that we get is the dichloro cyclopropane. I'll say plus the enantiomer. I've drawn one enantiomer. And just to indicate that it, we are not generating both enantiomers, but we are generating, uh, not generating one enantiomer, but generating both enantiomers. All right, so what's happening here? So you've got Chloroform, and chloroform is reasonably acidic. An alkane like methane has a pKa of 50, but with three electron withdrawing chlorine groups to stabilize the negative charge, the pKa of chloroform is about 25. And so tert butoxide is basic pKa of the conjugate acids about 19, or maybe your textbook says 17, but I think I usually think of it as about 19. Anyway, you generate an equilibrium concentration of dichloro of the corresponding conjugate base, as well as tert-butanol, and the conjugate base of chloroform can undergo an alpha elimination. And this looks a little funny. Follow your nose on the curved arrow pushing. If the leaving group, chloride, leaves with its pair of electrons, in other words, we lose Cl minus, 
we are left with dichlorocarbene. The chlorine takes the electrons from the bond, says, why should we have this very basic species, conjugate base 25, when I love electrons, my pKa of my conjugate acid is negative 6 for HCl. I'm going to take my electrons and leave. This is what you call an alpha elimination. And this is the way one generates a dichlorocarbene. You can do the same thing for the dibromocarbene. And so just to give you an analogous example, if we take cyclohexane, hexene, and treat it with bromoform and potassium tert-butoxide in tert-butanol, we end up with the dibromocyclopropane product. And I want to wrap up very, very quickly by introducing one last variant of a cyclopropanation reaction. And that's the Simmons-Smith reaction. So this was developed four years after Doring did his initial work. This was developed at DuPont in 1958 by Simmons and Smith. And the problem they were trying to address is that CH2 is not readily generated. It is too reactive to cyclopropanate. alkenes cleanly. One of the problems is that you have an accessible singlet state and it behaves like a biradical. In other words, instead of behaving like a two electron species with a vacant p orbital, it behaves like a biradical. And so what Simmons and Smith did is to tame methylene to tame the parent carbene as what is called a carbenoid. And I'll show you the example, and then I'll show you the carbenoid. If we take cyclohexene again, and we treat it with diiodomethane and zinc-copper couple. Zinc-copper couple is basically what happens if you put some zinc dust in copper sulfate. You end up with zinc where the surface has copper on it. It is especially reactive. And operationally, what that gets you is to the cyclopropane. Now, what's happening is very much like a Grignard reaction. Here is your diiodomethane. It reacts with zinc to form what is often called a carbenoid. And if you look at this, you'd say, oh, that looks just like a Grignard reagent. There's another resonance structure that you can think of. Like so. A non-bond resonance structure. If you think about, OK, just like we've written our Grignard reaction reagent in a zwitterionic form, we can think about a lone pair on the carbon and a negative charge. Oh, that's just like an alpha elimination. Anyway, the carbenoid basically is, is a, shall we say, tamed version of, so I'll say tamed. CH2. It's a tamed version of methylene. The practical result is a superb reaction for generating cyclopropanes without substituents, just like we can generate cyclopropanes with halogen substituents. All right, we will pick up talking about chapter 8. So read that for Monday, and we have our homework set due.